Welcome to Spirits Podcast, a boozy dive into mythology, legends, and folklore. Every week we pour a drink and learn about a new story from around the world. I'm Amanda. And I'm Julia. And this is episode 195, Your Urban Legends, number 38. I can't believe that we've gotten up to 38 of these. Like, it feels like we've been doing it from the start, but at the same time, it still feels new and fresh every time we do new stories. It truly does. And uh, we are doing the Multitude Annual Survey right now, mm. Bipper Bear, uh, Multitude.Productions slash survey. And the feedback from almost everybody is that we they want more of every kind of episode. <laughs> and it's very flattering. Um, and we also love doing Urban Legends. But also, uh, there's we can't do more of all of them. That Yeah, that's just not how time works unless we started doing multiple a week episodes, which I cannot personally do. Uh, I I cannot fathom it. But if you want to have your voice heard today and help us figure out how we are going to continue to run Spirits and Multitude, go to multitude.productions slash survey. It'll take about 10 minutes and it's a huge help to us. Yeah, that helps us. And also becoming a new patron helps us. Amanda, who are our new patrons this week? Thank you to Riley, Rachel, Abigail, Lady Zuzu, and Meg. You folks are wonderful humans who have great names. And that's mostly the only thing I know about you besides that you're wonderful and you pledge us money. Absolutely. And we would like to thank, as always, our supporting producer-level patrons, Philip, Alicia, Deborah, Hannah, Jen, Jessica, Keegan, Landon, Megan Linger, Megan Moon, Molly, Mr. Folk, Neil, Nikki, Phil Fresh, Pop. Holly, Sarah, and Skyla, as well as our legend-level patrons to whom I get to send fun presents every month, Audra, Avonlea, Chelsea, Clara, Donald, Drew, Eden, Francis, Jack Marie, Josie, Lada, Mark, Morgan, Necrofancy, Sarah, and Beam Me Up Scotty. Beam Me Up Scotty, coming through always at the end. Love it. Uh, Julia, let me know, what have you been reading, watching, or listening to this week? So I have been listening, Amanda, my my good friend, Kristen DiMercurio, who has not been on the show, but has been on a bunch of other stuff that we do and is our, our neighbor in the studio there, has put out a fantastic show and a fantastic finale. The show is Brimstone Valley Mall, if you like the 90s, if you like demons, if you like Hot Topic, if you like carousels, if you like goth culture, this is the fiction podcast for you. She's fantastic. The show is fantastic. And you can check that out in your podcast player now. And the whole first season is available right now. So if you're the kind of person who likes to marathon through a whole season rather than waiting for new episodes to come out, now's the perfect time to listen to it. It's your moment, friend. And next week, we have our Myth Movie Night. We are going to be watching Scooby-Doo and the Loch Ness Monster because we really haven't talked a whole bunch about the Loch Ness Monster on the show before. And watching it through the lens of Scooby-Doo is always a fun, fun adventure for us. It absolutely is. It's a tight 72 minutes, Mm. uh, not even a tight 90, a tight 72. So, uh, you know, cook dinner and eat dinner and then the movie will be done. There you go. Well, I'm looking forward to it, Julia. But in the meantime, everybody, enjoy Spirits Podcast, episode 195, Your Urban Legends, number 38. Everybody, I am pretty sure the house is not haunted. Oh, yeah? Okay. Can you confirm that, though? I mean, there's no way to confirm a negative. Mm. So... Is there? I can't. <laughs> no, there's not. I don't I'm know. Just you a I don't think there is. I think that's the whole thing. Uh, so, I, yeah, I don't... I We have not experienced any hauntings. We have not experienced any weird... Doors closing, things like that. I've no longer been startled by my chair just sitting in the office. Good. Amazing. Currently, we're dealing with some electrical issue in which just like half of the stuff on the second floor doesn't have power. But I wouldn't consider that so much a haunting as a home improvement project that needs to be sorted out. Consider, though, ghosts Mm -hmm. in the wires. Now, ghosts in the wires, I feel like, would indicate the things that are plugged into the wires are having some supernatural aura or effect upon them. Like my computer would be flickering. The TV would have a creepy girl crawling out of it. <laughs> That's usually how but, that works. But, yeah. but none, of, none of that is happening. So okay. if everything feels on the level with the wires other than the ones that currently have no power. I'm just saying if this was a horror movie, it would start off very normal and not Mm -hmm. really consequential. And then it ramps up to full girl crawling out of the television while it flickers. Yeah. I mean, if if it does escalate, I'll I'll you'll be the first to know. Thank you. For sure. Appreciate it. Now I'm trying to think like what if ghosts are just really good electrical insulators? And Mm. when they occupy space in the wires, they are so good at insulating electricity that none can transmit none shall pass 
Yeah. So what if what if ghosts help us with like energy conservation? Hmm. You have a green home by having a ghost in it. Okay. Yeah. Green like the grass of graves. This is a bold claim. I like it. I mean, I think we could get some real traction on Facebook with strip your wires, get <laughs> haunted, <in> there. <laughs> and really see how that that uh, becomes a popular thing online. I will say, Amanda, though, I feel like a lot of hauntings kind of surround the idea of lights turning on when they shouldn't be turned on rather right. than being turned off when they shouldn't be turned off. So I feel like ghosts are wasting more electricity than they're saving or maybe it's a maybe it's like a, a net balance there that's a very good point we did we did have an experience last night with a light not turning on mm. so here's what happened our our ceiling fan in the living room has a remote control and kelsey went to turn on the light and the fan and it didn't turn on but that was because the light switch hadn't been flipped yet, which then I did and everything worked perfectly fine. Okay, well, as long as you had a solution there. <laughs> less less an issue than just like an order of operation scoop. Yeah, that was, a little, uh, that was a little twist for you on that one. There we go. So I've got a story ca- called The Time the Ghost Loved Me But Decided to Scare the Shit Out of My Husband. Oh no, I, I sense a, a, a dramatic kind of love triangle, supernatural love triangle here. I'm into mm. it. Love a discerning ghost. Mm. Love a ghost that knows where they stand. Yes. So this comes to us from Katie, and she writes, Happy spoops, my tipsy tale tellers. I come bearing the lovely gift of story, and I couldn't resist the alliteration. Aw. I wanted to start by saying I have always been bothered by ghosts, even when I claimed up and down that I didn't believe in them. I've had anxiety since I was a toddler, so I always tried to use the excuse that it was just my anxiety causing me to see ghosts. But... Maybe it was the ghost causing me the anxiety. Who knows? Bold claim. When I was a little girl, I used to be terrified of the western side of my bedroom, specifically the corner of my bedroom with both my closet and one of the windows. My little sister and I shared that room until I was 11. And then, till the day I switched rooms, I always made her sleep in the same bed as me. Mm. I swear something malicious stood in that corner and just watched us as we slept. Spooky. Even as an adult, when the room was my niece's, I never let my back turn to that corner because I knew something was still there watching me. As a person who like sleeps better when I'm not sharing a bed with a person, my husband like not included in this, uh, only because we have a big enough bed. So I don't find comfort in other people being in the same bed as me. I don't know why. I just don't. It's a thing I always thought of as like a Victorian novel situation where it's like, oh, yes, in Little Women, it was four, four abreast in the bed. And I, you know, brought my sister in to ward off the chill and also the ghosts. I feel like warding off the chill is very important. Yes. Ward off the chill <laughs> is a <like laughs> great phrase. I have been reading uh, a set of, of mysteries that feature an archaeologist digging up like Roman and Bronze Age bodies in the UK. And the number of like antiquated architectural terms I have learned is outstanding. So I really feel like my vocabulary is like stretching only backward. Incredible. Kelsey wards off the chill by using what she refers to as a heat nugget which is the dogs. Aww. (laughs) Very cute. I used to see a little brown-haired girl in my friend's house, hear the pitter-pattering of people through the halls and the doors slamming when no one else was home. And of course, I'll never forget the time where I heard someone walking up the stairs and then made the mistake of looking only to have my body feel like it was on fire the moment I looked down the empty staircase. Here's the thing. I always think of ghosts as grayscale. So when someone says they have like a specific colored hair, that always kind of throws me for a loop. Like I can imagine dark hair or light hair. Like you can tell it's blonde because it's light. But I, when they're like brown haired, I'm like, how do you know that? Yeah. Most of the time I chose to use the Eric approved method of just ignoring <laughs> mm. it. No TM. matter how much it bothered me. And that is what I tried to do with the ghost that led me to write this story. It's Love the opposite of, uh, of of political uh, problems where like in civics, you can't just ignore it. You got to register to vote. Right. When I finally became a real adult and moved into a house in May of 2019, they say they mention that because they love specific dates. Oh, yep. Um, <laughs> As we do on this show. I expected the normal weird feelings and cold spots. I used to work night shifts. So I was frequently awake all hours of the night while my husband, then fiance, was asleep. We lived in a three-bedroom house, and since we had no kids, one of the other rooms was turned into my office. 
I like to play video games and hang out with my friends in voice chat and often found myself feeling someone was watching me when no one was there. No, bad, bad. I frequently would swear I heard my husband call my name and would take my headphones off to respond to him only to realize he had already gone to sleep. Soon as I realized it wasn't him, I made the educated decision to simply ignore it. Perfect. Nope. I got the sense that whoever it was that called my name was often watching me, staring over my shoulders as I played video games in the office and sometimes even from the other couch when I was in the living room watching television. I never thought it was malicious, and actually I got the feeling that he quite liked me. Not wanting to freak my husband out with my weird senses, which he's probably used to at this point, I simply never told him and ignored it for months. Until he told me about this January. Oh boy. Oh. One day when I was at work, I got a flurry of texts from my husband about someone in the house. Nope, only bad. to receive a message saying a little while later that there was no one there. And he would tell me about it when he got home. That I That's probably, I'm going to say it's the ghost texting him. Oh yeah, no, one. I think that that's Ooh. definitely a decoy. And uh, I would rush home from whatever I was doing. As we know, ghosts like TikTok can swipe on different videos and stuff on TikTok can also text now, probably. They're like the velociraptors of paranormal activity. They like wires. But guys, what if they like wireless networks even more? <gasps> Ghosts in the Wi-Fi. Mm. It, it like extends their range. You know what I mean? And maybe a haunted object in your house is like a, like a Wi-Fi uh, booster, Hotspot. like a signal booster. <laughs> have yeah. we considered it? I don't think we have considered it. I don't like it. But I'm sure an upcoming horror film will. Now, it wasn't the best neighborhood we lived in, so I was worried that maybe someone had just tried to break in and the dog scared them off. But that wasn't the case. It had been nearly midnight, and before my husband went to bed, he spent most of the quality time on the toilet, only to be interrupted by what sounds like someone standing in the kitchen talking. My husband said he heard a man clear as day talking to our dogs. Now, our dogs absolutely hate men they haven't been introduced to, but my husband still freaked out and raced out of the bathroom to find absolutely no one in the kitchen. Just both of our dogs sitting there staring at the same spot in the dining room. So he searched the entire house, not trusting that the dog simply did not react to a stranger in our house, only to find the doors locked and windows shut and no one in the entire house. Once knowing the house was safe, he decided to continue on with his evening, and as he was getting ready for bed, suddenly there was a pounding on our front door. Not simply knocking, but a full-blown movie-style beating from our front door as if the murderer was right behind them. So, of course, my husband raced to the door terrified of what he would find, except he unlocked the front door and yanked it open. Not even the snow on the porch had been disturbed. The glass was securely closed and not a footprint shown in the freshly fallen snow. This is why I don't trust houses that, like, have doors that don't have windows on the front or doors that don't have peepholes. No, bad, bad. Redesign your doors. out there. Just the wind, he told himself, and as he closed the door, he decided to go to sleep. <laughs> Except 15 minutes... <laughs> oh, oh, people. Make better decisions. Except 15 minutes later, the same pounding sounded at our back door, banging over and over again as if someone was begging to get let in, as if their life depended on it. But again, my husband hurried to the door and nothing was there. The backyard was still, no signs of anyone near, and the snow once again undisturbed. So he did the same thing and went back to the bedroom. As he finally was getting ready to go to sleep, he realized not once did either dog react to anything that had happened that evening. Our dogs bark at squirrels farting in the front yard, yet they were completely relaxed and had not made a single sound all evening. Can a ghost really be that bad if the dogs aren't bothered by it? I feel like, again, every horror movie where there is something demonic or bad, the dogs bark at it and then eventually die. But that's bad horror trope and we shouldn't appreciate that. If the dog's cool, I'm cool. That's yeah. generally true. Maybe yeah. the dog's super... Chill. Stealthy. Just a super chill super, dog. Super, <laughs> super chill. My husband never experienced the ghost after that, but I did. He continued to keep me company most nights. Normally he would just watch me, but once I watched as he walked out of the office and into the living room, blocking the hall light momentarily. My eyes stayed glued to my computer screen when it happened, too terrified to even acknowledge that it was real. Needless to say, we moved out after our 12 months lease was up and have yet to have an issue with him since. Well, the lady in our basement at the new house is a different story, I'm though. I'm sorry, what? No! no! Love Stop. you guys so much. Thanks for everything you do. Stop moving into haunted places. God damn it. And and with the cliffhangers, you can just, you can just continue the email. I have to know. Ugh. So bad now. So I got two swamp stories for y'all. Ooh. 
You always choose such good thematic links, Julia. Thank you. I try my best. So I'm going to start with one from Jay titled Paranormal Activity and Screams in the Swamp. I, in parentheses, unknowingly moved into a haunted house. Excellent. Uh, I just got breaking news um, that there is a game out for Switch called Raji, an Ancient Epic, which is about um, ancient India. There's like a uh, you get chosen by the gods to like stand against evil. Ooh, that sounds fun. Is it just for Switch? Most Switch games are also on PC. Cool. Generally. That aren't like Nintendo ones. So Jay writes that she has been marathoning through our back catalog and I finally caught up. I love the show and all the creepy cool things that I've been learning when listening. I was going to write about my Catholic high school, which was located in a converted 1910s mansion and extremely haunted. But I just listened to your Ghostbusters case episode and instead I have a story for you about moving into our current house, which we quickly discovered was already occupied by a ghost. Nice. The story begins in 2002 when my boyfriend, now husband, and I moved from eastern Pennsylvania to the east central coast of Florida for his job. Over the next 14 years, we got married, bought a house, had a daughter, and then moved across town. The area of Florida in which we live used to be farmland back in the early 1900s, and the family that was developing the area retains conservation areas, parks, and open spaces amidst all of the housing, shops, etc. The house we bought was built in 2001 and backs up to a preserve, which means we have no people neighbors behind us and the view from our screened-in pool deck is wild, chaotic Florida swamp, complete with critter neighbors of all kinds, egrets, herons, sandhill cranes, hawks, owls, frogs, snakes, lizards, turtles, raccoons, possums, armadillos, bun-buns, otters, and even bobcats. Wowee. That is a lot of animals. We don't have water directly behind our property, so we only see alligators when we walk around the neighborhood's nature trail, which goes around a small pond. When it gets foggy some mornings, the backyard looks like something out of a Stephen King short story. Very spooky. When we first looked at the house, my husband and I jokingly agreed that you could totally bury a body back there and it would never be found. (laughs) I also make those kinds of jokes. Gladstone's not just me. Same. We moved into the house in November of 2016, and immediately weird things started happening. Objects that I would unpack would go missing, then reappear in another room in the house. Items of clothing would disappear, then show up in the guest bedroom or in the family room on the floor neatly folded. A small metal jewelry box on my dresser kept falling onto the floor when no one had been in the room for hours. I explained all of that away with the chaos of moving and unpacking. Then, things got weirder. Our front porch light burned out, even though it had just been replaced prior to our moving in. One of the lights in our bedroom went out, so I went to replace it, and it came on again right before I touched the bulb. This happened so many times, I made sure the bulb was screwed in tight, it was, and I gave up trying to change it and just left it alone. Several times a week, we'd wake up in the morning and the TV in the family room would be on and on a different channel than it had been when we turned it off the night before. My daughter, who was six at the time and very into Scooby-Doo, said, Mommy, I think we have a ghost. (laughs) Kids are creepy and know things, so my husband and I agreed with her. Rather than be scared by it, we started to say hello, ghost, when it would do its harmless, ghostly (laughs) things. So again, we're talking about haunted houses where the electricity is being either misused. I think misused is the right word for it. I think this is a great ghost management strategy, and it's a very good thing to teach kids as well. Like, I am still learning in therapy. When you have the anxious, intrusive thought, you're like, thank you. Thank you for considering that. I think not. And then you kind of move along. So I think this is great. Absolutely. Yeah. So after a month or so of these occurrences, my husband offered a theory. He said, quote, so the couple that we bought the house from, the husband signed all the paperwork before we got to the closing and immediately boarded a plane to Portland. What if he killed his wife and hid her body in the swamp and she's our ghost? Oh, no. Obviously, he was joking, so we both laughed. That night was the first night I heard the screams. (sighs) Oh, shit. What a turn. I was woken up around 3 a.m. by a loud, high-pitched scream echoing through the preserve behind the house. My heart pounded as the scream repeated a few times, then stopped. This happened constantly for several minutes as I lay frozen in my bed. The preserve is super dark at night, and there is no way in hell I was getting up to look out the window. Eventually, it got quiet, and I went back to sleep. When I told my husband and my daughter about it the next morning, neither of them had heard it. Also, you told your daughter about it? About screams from the swamp? No. Oh, no. She's six. Swamp screams. Kids gotta know. 
Kids gotta know about the swamp screams. <laughs> oh boy. I hope that she approached it in sort of like a, hey, did you guys hear anything weird last night in the swamp? I bet. Okay, I hope that was the way. And I'd be like, yo, listen to these screams that I heard. <laughs> did you also get woken up at 3 a.m. by the ghostly screams? Mm-hmm. They both agreed that it was probably some sort of animal, but it was totally the ghost. I was not amused. What if it was the ghost of the previous owner's wife? Was she angry at us because we haven't found her and we're living in her home? That night, the screams woke me up again. This time, my husband heard them too. It had to be an animal, he said. But we lived in Florida for 14 years around all sorts of noisy creatures, and we never heard anything like that before. The screaming went on all night. We both refused to go look out the window and then put earplugs in and tried to go to sleep. The next morning, I was eating breakfast and again heard the screams, this time very close. Terrified, I slowly opened the blinds and peered nervously out the back window. And there, in a tall tree, were two bird friends that we had never seen before. They were the cause of the screams in the night. We looked them up in our bird book and they were called limpkins. They're also called the wailing bird or crying bird. Their loud calls are described as haunting, mournful, and banshee-like, can confirm. Apparently, the male screams to defend their territory as well as attract mates, which, come on, bro. If you're trying to get laid, is screaming loudly in the middle of the night really going to bring all the ladies? I guess it works for the Limpkin ladies, but yeah, not so much for me. The cause of the nightly and then daily, seriously, the bro needs to get laid, screams determined. We also found out from our realtor that the wife of the previous owner had missed the closing because she started a job in Oregon as soon as the house went up for sale. So sigh of relief there. There you go. There was a simple explanation for the screams and we were not being haunted by the angry ghosts of a murdered previous owner. But something is haunting our house, that's for sure. All the ghostly activity continued, and we kept saying hello to the ghost. Then occurrences began to taper off, and after being in the house for almost four years, not much paranormal happens anymore. I firmly believe that the ghost is still around, though, and sometimes I will leave out a small offering of wine and bread. Smart, good choice. Perhaps it is used to us, or at least approves of our presence in the house. I do still find my metal jewelry box on the bedroom floor sometimes, and as I put it back on the dresser, I always say, hello, ghost. Oh, that's the end. I like that. This bird is probably getting drunk on some wine, too. (laughs) That bird is definitely getting drunk on wine, and then he's even louder and getting more laid. I have another um, ghostly real estate story. Are you ready for it? Oh, hell yeah. Hit us. This comes from Daphne, and it's titled Camp Ghosts and Townhouse Brownies. I have two stories I'd like to share. I've always been very sensitive to my surroundings, so there is plenty to tell. This first one is my actual experience. I had quite a few as a teen, but this one traumatized me for months. The rest of my family would spend entire weekends out of town, leaving just me and a dog to hold the fort down. What a teenage dream. Let me just first say. Adorable. I love that. Just me and my dog going on adventures, staying in the house by ourselves. Late one night, I was preparing for a shower, and in brackets, I know, when I felt something watching me. Oh, no. Daphne is Daphne afraid that we're going to be like, don't shower when you're alone. <laughs> well, I think it's just like, you know, the typical horror movie trope where yeah. it's like you're vulnerable and alone in the shower and then the uh, killer comes and stabs you a bunch of times. Fair. Psycho. Basically psycho. <laughs> I had already put our dog to bed, so I whipped around and briefly saw a hairy humanoid about knee high that looked up at me, gave me an expression of whoops, and disappeared. Oh, fuck no. Oh, fuck no. The carbon monoxide detector never (laughs) once made a beep. Quick safety (laughs) disclaimer, Daphne includes, light carbon monoxide poisoning can be an experience similar to a haunting. Mm -hmm. So make sure you have a detector in your home. It's true. It's very important. Uh, Back to the story. So I spent the rest of my weekend in terror trying to figure out what the spirit was and huddled up with my dog on the couch. For years later, if I dropped anything smaller than a pen in the bathroom, I would bend over to pick it up from where I had seen it drop, be unable to find it on the floor, even though it had just dropped, and then stand up to find it on the bathroom counter. It's got to be like a domovoy or a brownie or something, right? Yeah. I think it was the spirit apologizing for giving me such a fright. Still no idea what it was, but I started calling it our household brownie. Yeah, it's like a it's like a little household spirit. That's why he's so hairy. And uh, yeah, he's just trying to pick up stuff for you. Be, be I chill. Agree. Don't like mess. He made a mistake, though, revealing himself to you. I love that, that its reaction was, oops, <laughs> oops, my bad. And then just bounce. The second story was an urban legend that I accidentally contributed to. Which I thought was just a fantastic twist. So this is the girls camp ghost. 
I went to a religious camp in the Sierras for a few years as a teen. The camp was on some cliffs overlooking a lake, so there were plenty of ways to get ghosts. The older girls told us about a woman who had fallen off a cliff years before. The details were vague, but she would come back up to the campsite nearest the edge of the cliff, look sadly into the water, and just stand there with her dark hair blowing in the wind. I never felt anything remotely ghost-like, so I thought it was probably just to scare us younger girls. The thing is, I had my hair down to my elbows at the time, and I've always been pretty pale. So one evening, I set out on the rocks behind my cabin to brush my hair in a white sweatshirt, and the next thing I hear is a girl screaming from the cabin next door about the ghost. It took me a few minutes of looking around panicked and feeling things out to realize she meant me. (laughs) That's very funny. Ah, that's good. Just a nice little, uh, a little, little reverse mo. I appreciate that. Yeah, I, I love the idea of children getting it into their heads that there must be a ghost. So when they see something that could even possibly confirm it, they're like, "It was the ghost. It was the ghost the whole time." We don't have enough like mysteries solved on this show. Yeah, we need more. We mysteries need some solved. like s- solid ghost busting cases closed. The invoice has been sent. Oh yeah, we figured it out. <laughs> Stamped for approval. Too many are just mysteries. <laughs> we might as well run the X Files show right here. Yeah, there we go. Yeah, if you have a solved mystery, definitely send it in. But I do also like the idea of it could be a ghost. No one can tell us otherwise that it is a ghost, you know? I like that. I'm just saying it'd be nice if every so often it was like, we got this one. It was just a kid. It was just a kid chilling. Make it a weird sound. I'm fine with one solved mystery per episode. How about that? Excellent. Okay, yeah, great. I-, I like it. A little palate cleanser. Speaking of palate cleansers, should we go get a refill? Let's do it. Amanda, you and I have been recently looking at our schedules for next year, and hopefully, fingers crossed, we will be able to go to more conferences and stuff like that. And I know that once we are able to go to those things and be seen out in the world, I'm going to have some awesome outfits thanks to Stitch Fix. Stitch Fix is a personal styling company that brings you the world of fashion and style. It's really different, and it's a fun way to find clothes that you'll love that's all about you every single time. To get started, all you have to go to is stitchfix.com com slash spirits to set up a profile and then they deliver these great personalized looks just for you in like the colors and the styles and the budget that you're looking for you just pay this $20 styling fee for each fix which is credited towards anything you keep so if you pick out a really great shirt that they sent you that $20 goes to that shirt and there's no subscription required plus shipping returns and exchanges are always free so you can pick what month you get the stitch fix box You can, you know, skip it another month. It's really easy and simple to do. Stitch Fix does all of the hard work for you. It makes great styling effortless for everyone. So you can get started today at stitchfix.com slash spirits, and you'll get 25% off when you keep everything in your fix. Again, that's stitchfix.com slash spirits for 25% off when you keep everything in your fix. Stitchfix.com slash spirits. We are also sponsored this week by Calm, and getting a good night's sleep can be hard to come by, whether it's screen stuff or drinking caffeinated stuff or just being kind of overstimulated or anxious at night. I know I've definitely felt that. So that is why we're excited to partner with Calm, which is a mental fitness app. I love that. Designed to help you relieve anxiety and improve your sleep. Calm helps you ease stress and get good sleep because they have a whole library of programs designed to help you get to bed uh, healthily and quickly. Their soundscapes, guided meditation, and over a hundred sleep stories narrated by the likes of uh, LeVar Burton, Nick Offerman, and Lucy Liu. Mm. So if you go to calm.com slash spirits, you'll get a limited time offer of 40% off a Calm premium subscription. That includes hundreds of hours of programming. Over 70 million people around the world use Calm to help take care of their minds and get better sleep. So join them today. That's C-A-L-M dot C-O-M slash spirits for 40% off a Calm premium subscription calm.com slash spirits. And now let's get back to the show. All right, guys, what are we drinking this episode? So the thing is, I'm usually not an IPA kind of person, but this summer is just hitting me different. And I've been really, really enjoying them a bit more than I usually do. So this time I picked up the Spectral Haze Hazy IPA from Blue Point, which I feel like I've recommended some of theirs before, but it's a great brewery here on Long Island. And this one in particular has like a really nice kind of melony tropical vibe to it while not being too, too, too bitter. Sounds delicious. Yeah, it's really good. For my birthday, I picked up a a nice bottle of Oyo whiskey, uh, cherry 
barrel age something or whatever. <laughs> okay. And it's some of the best just sipping whiskey I've ever had. Gotta love a uh, sipping It's a bit whiskey. more expensive than I usually go for, but I figured, you know, having a birthday, not having a birthday party due to these times, uh, it felt like it felt like the right right decision to kind of uh, have a, something a little special to celebrate with with me me and Kelsey. That sounds nice. So I, so I did that. Yeah, lovely. We also had um, a friend over to our roof to have a, a socially distanced outdoor hang, and it was the first time we had company over in a long time. So I picked up uh, this collaboration between Shaxbury Cider, which is one of my absolute favorites of all time, and Zaffa Wines. Um, they have a like sunshiny blend of hybrid La Crescent grapes and foraged mm-hmm. wild apples from Vermont. Um, it is called Electric Mayhem, and it comes in cans, and it is absolutely fantastic. That sounds really good. Shout out to Dandelion Wine, our local shop. We're continuing on our tradition of loving Vermont on this show. Truly. I've got a short little little spooky tale titled The Singing Sands of Bay Degree. Ooh. This comes to us from Ashley, and she writes, Hey, Amanda, Julia, and Eric. I'm a longtime listener and particularly love the hometown urban legends. I grew up in the Upper Peninsula of Michigan, which is home to some wonderful legends. One of my favorites is The Singing Sand. What does it sing? What kind of genre do we think the sand sings? I think it's like... Ska. I was going to go K-pop. <laughs> I think like a warbling uh, folk ballad. Oh, see, so Amanda gave most... a real answer. The rest yeah, of us It's are... probably mostly like, remember when the, not that we were alive there, but do you remember when watching VH1's I Love the 80s, or maybe it was I Love the 90s, and like Gregoria chanting music got released like as like a popular thing? That, no. I'm sorry, what? That was a thing? I mean, I only vaguely remember this because of like a 45 second moment of I Love, what I think, I think I Love the 90s. So I, I can't tell you any more thing more about it, but apparently some, some monks, uh, Got it. Up on us, up on CDs. Do you know what genre I really wish would make a comeback in the 2020s? What? No. Sea shanties. Right? That would be good. Yeah. Send me your sea yeah. shanties, listeners. I want to hear all your sea shanties. Give us a mournful ballad about your spouse that died at sea or a yeah. fun little like drunk body song that we can all drink to. So back to these singing sounds. Yes. Beatty Gree is on the shore of Lake Superior where the sand sings. The legend is that the singing comes from a Native American woman looking for her love who was lost to the water's depths. She is forever searching, though, for it's said that Lake Superior seldom gives up her dead. Visitors to Beatty Gree help her by rubbing the sand to amplify her song or by hitting the sand to make it bark. The singing only works while it's on the beach. Once it's taken away, its voice is lost and the sand is silent. That's cool. Too far from the water to call for the woman's missing lover. Mm. The legend is both beautiful and tragic. The sand really does sing and bark too. There's many more legends from this area. And I even have one myself about a witch in the walls of my childhood home. But the singing sands has always stood out to me. Thank you for all that you do. It's truly loved and appreciated. That legend reminded me of a book I just read uh, called Sourdough by Robin Sloan, who is a very good, like creepy, uh, like creepy, but good weird fiction, you know, sort of Jeff Vandermeer style writing um, about in part a sourdough starter um, that responds to music and when removed from its context or played different music responds differently. That's very cool and reminds me of Flubber. That's true. (laughs) Yeah. There we go. So I'm coming at you guys again with another swamp story. You're ready for for some swamp story. I'm always in the swamp, Julia. I'm always, you know me. They call they call me Eric the Swamp Thing Schneider. <laughs> I love it. Such a good choice for you. So this is from Linda, and she has titled this email, A Corpse Swamp and a Ghost Headmaster. So Linda says, hey, Spirits team, I am from Finland, and I want to tell you two creepy stories that have stuck with me since I was a child. The first one is a place called Rumisoa, which... I probably did not pronounce that correctly in Finnish, I apologize, which translates to corpse swamp. When I was a kid, one of my neighbors used to scare the kids in our neighborhood by telling us about the corpse swamp, where he claimed that people had been buried alive many years ago. I always thought that he was joking and just didn't want us kids playing near the swamp until a few years ago when I found out that the stories he had told us weren't complete bullshit. Apparently, people who died from the plague and people who were executed during the Finnish Civil War in 1918 were buried in the swamp. There is something sinister about the whole place. Some people experience feelings of extreme anxiety when they are near the swamp, 
And other people claim that they've heard howling, more human-like than wolf-like, from the depths of the forest surrounding the swamp. I never experienced that myself, but a few years ago my siblings and I accidentally found an abandoned house in the middle of the forest near the corpse swamp. Not good. Sounds bad, actually. The place was super creepy, and it felt like time stood still there. Nothing had been touched in decades. Moss and trees grew on piles of old wood and on old boats, and plastic packages that were laying around dated back to the 60s and 70s. All the doors were locked and all the curtains were closed, but otherwise it looked like the people who had lived there had left in a hurry. I'm not sure if this place was connected to the corpse swamp in any way, but I can assure you I'm not going back there anytime soon. Dang. Spooky. Don't like that. I just want to say corpse swamp is like what happens when you're like dealing with a lazy DM. (laughs) <laughs> like what's what's this what's this spot that we've accident we we've clearly not been following the sides you want us to go to this town so we've headed east through the woods and we've come across the corpse swamp yeah, it's a corpse swamp mm, the corpse swamp it feels like a place out of the princess bride mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. feels right this is bringing back memories for me of um as kids up in the Adirondacks, we would like sled in sort of backwoods hills where you'd have to like kind of hike through very narrow paths that were kind of wide enough for a car, but not really. Parents just let us go. I'm not really sure why. Um, and there were a lot of cabins that were like very rustic to begin with. And it was hard to tell which ones were uh, abandoned and which ones were just like someone's holiday house and they weren't there which ones had full-time people but they were out like hunting or doing errands so i i remember trying the doorknobs on these houses and it was like just kind of uh you know like transgressive enough that i was like "Ooh, i'm trying the doorknob and then if it ever turned i would just like immediately run away (laughs) i was gonna say amanda for you as a child that's still pretty bold you know i mean that yeah that's why that's impressive like you were about to commit a felony, just a, <laughs> some light breaking and entering. It is still breaking and entering, even if you just open an open door. But it yeah. didn't open. I just turned it, so mm. it's just the breaking. I think part. you you broke the seal of the door <laughs> by Therefore, having the lock un unhatched. Judge, it was just the breaking. Man, it could have gone to juvie. Julia, Julia, we can finally get out of going undercover and doing this podcast. We finally got. <laughs> we got. We finally her. got the backwoods cabin door turner. I can't believe after all this time, she's finally admitted to it. <laughs> finally, jeez. Also, we talk about the backwoods a lot, but we never talk about the frontwoods. Yeah, what's Is up with those? Is that just like the start of the forest? <laughs> yeah. Is the frontwoods just the, like, the tree line, essentially? Yeah. I think it's like the forest visible from the road, you know? Yes. Mm, yeah. 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 Bordering something, that's the frontwoods. Yeah. Gotcha. Okay. The second story is a ghost story that the older kids used to tell the younger kids in my elementary school. The school was very small. We were around 60 students there. And until the 70s or the 80s, a part of the school building had been the headmaster's apartment. According to the legend, the last headmaster who lived in the apartment died a tragic death in the attic, where he got stuck between two huge air-conditioned propellers and was smashed to death. That's brutal. Woof. Yeah. It is said that his soul was never able to rest, and his ghost was said to haunt the school. My best friend and I were obsessed with the story in a way that I'm sure, like, most small children are with the idea of, like, death and it being close proximity to, like, where you are. And we used to ask our teachers about it all the time, of course. One of them told us that the school still regularly received letters and bills addressed to the headmaster, even though he had been dead for decades. I don't know if that's true or if the teacher told us that to make us stop asking questions, but it obviously sparked our imaginations even more. I hope you enjoyed my stories. I love your show. Keep up the good work. Love, Linda. Thanks, Linda. Thanks, Linda. Thank you, very much. Thank you for the imagery of a man getting squashed in air conditioner propellers. That's not Indiana <laughs> Jones related at all. I did uh, install a air conditioner, new one in the Multitude Studio last week, and um, it's heavy. We're on the third floor. I was yeah. like, well. If this drops, it drops. Well, here we are. <laughs> oh, boy. My next story is from Erin. It is titled Nighttime Wanderings. My favorite story in this email is about uh, the opposite of wandering, which is staying still. <laughs> it's very on brand for you 
I'll start by saying that my family has always had a history of interesting sleepwalking and talking incidents. For example, my grandfather once ended up in the military and obviously having a tendency of sleepwalking, not a great trait for someone doing that as it could be very dangerous. Mm -hmm. Yet there he was. So he was in a tent that he shared with many other men. My grandfather got up suddenly and started talking loudly as if he was responding to a commanding officer. The other men in the tent woke up quickly to watch what was happening. And as they watched, he pulled on his boots and marched out of the tent, went down to the docks and started directing boats that weren't there. His mates followed him outside, completely confused as to what was happening. But they soon figured out that he would respond to them making commands. So one of them called him away from his duties and ordered him back to his tent for bed. He completely obeyed, marched back to the tent, and got back in bed. The men realized he must have been sleepwalking. Whether it had happened before or not, I don't know. Because why else would he get out of his bed in the middle of the night and start attending his duties butt naked? Oh, no, but naked. I love the reveal there of the information. Uh, but that's that's very smart. If he's if he thinks he's at work, then order him back. Yeah. I, I also like it really took them that long to realize he was sleepwalking. He's just walking around doing his duties. Ass crack naked. I don't know. Maybe they were they thought he was just joshing, just pranking. Maybe. Now for my own personal story. When I was about 10 years old, I had an experience I didn't understand at the time to be terrifying. But now I think about it and realize how lucky I got the night it occurred. I was staying in a cabin. And someone <laughs> opened the door, but only opening a little bit. The door, just turning the door knobs. <laughs> and then they decided to run away. And I saw a child in a purple snowsuit. <laughs> So it starts with my sister going away for a few nights. I don't remember where, but it isn't important. She's unrelated to the story. But the fact that her bedroom was empty has everything to do with it. What a sick burn on your sister. (laughs) I know. She doesn't matter. Also, this is how this is how talking happens. And then podcasts get edited to sound like we're talking in sentences to begin with. So Mm -hmm. I just appreciated the sort of stream of consciousness here. So her bedroom was empty that night. My sister had a cool bunk bed with a double bed on the bottom and a single bed on the top. That does sound cool. I know. I always wanted a bed like that. So while she was gone, I decided I would spend a night or two in her bed because she would never allow it any other time. Ghosts won't like that. It's going to be a ghost problem. Everything was fine and sleeping in her bed was fun and exciting. But one night I woke up and decided I should go to the bathroom. The experience was strange. I remember it vividly, but I couldn't see anything at all as if the room was pitch black. I couldn't see my own hands in front of my face even. I wonder if I was partly asleep because if my eyes were open, I know I would have seen at least the streetlight peeking through the curtains, but I saw nothing at all. I crawled to the edge of the bed, since I was in the double bed on the bottom, and went to step off. But I couldn't. No, bad, bad, bad. There was a barrier of sorts in my way. I felt it with my hands, and it seemed to be wooden. I was really confused as to why there would be a wooden board there, but it wasn't very tall, so I simply lifted my leg over it and made to step off the bed. No. But my foot didn't touch the floor. Strange, I thought. I should be able to touch the floor easily, even with this board in the way. I'm on the bottom bunk. I tried and tried to step off the bed, but my foot never touched the ground, no matter how far I lent my leg over the side. I decided that it really wasn't worth it to go to the bathroom anymore, so I gave up and went back to sleep. It's definitely not. Is it like a floorboard opened up? Like a ghost tore up a floorboard or a person? Was there a person living in their basement? I had my own uh, guess. I'll tell you at the end. I slept fine for the rest of the night. And in the morning, I woke up not in my sister's bed, but in my own. As I mentioned earlier, I didn't realize the significance of this until the morning after. In fact, I don't remember when I realized it was significant. It might even have been weeks later. I remembered what had happened that night and finally understood what had actually happened. I hadn't slept walked from my sister's bed into mine. No, I'd never actually left my own bed at all, and I'm glad I didn't. Because it was roughly six and a half feet tall. As in, I had a top bunk with a large desk underneath and a double bed on top. That is the coolest bed I've ever heard of. That is very cool. The strange board I was trying to step over was the safety rail that stopped me falling six and a half feet to the ground. So it isn't necessarily an urban legend, but it is no doubt a very strange incident that I am really glad happened. But that is good. It's a good thing you didn't tumble out of that bed. I assumed that that Erin had slept walked into the top bunk of her sister's bed. Oh, okay. But I understand how sleeping for one night on a double bed in the bottom and then moving to your own double bed at the top uh, could feel confusing. So Erin, uh, I'm, I'm glad you're all right. Yeah, yeah. Could have been bad. And has anyone here taken a tumble out of a, a tall bed before? uh i i have okay i had a tallish bed it was like it wasn't like a bunk bed but there was like a dresser underneath of it Mm. and i fell out of it a couple times don't remember much about it 
Yeah, I used to loft my bed a lot in college because then you would have more storage under the bed and stuff. And I think I rolled out of it once or twice, but I, I'm fine now. <laughs> yeah, same here. Uh, but always of like regular standard height beds. Mm-hmm. My brother Austin fell out of his regular twin bed once and broke his collarbone when he was a toddler. Impressive. <laughs> he That's also a bad bone to break for a toddler. They move a lot. Yeah, it did. It did send him on his career path, though, because he was so impressed by the firefighters that he became one. Um, nice. But mm, I they did so much riskier things. <laughs> and like toddlers do. They, they fall and hit their heads all the time. So to just peacefully fall out of bed one night, we were like, this? This is what this is what got you? <laughs> really, Brad? Anyway, thanks, Aaron, for that email. Very nice. Guys, I do just want to close out this Urban Legend episode by saying that there has been breaking spirits related mm. news as we've oh. been sitting in this recording. What's happening? What's going it on? is um, Indie Game Showcase Day for Nintendo Switch. Oh. And uh, Eric Silver, as well as friend of the show, Yvonne, have been texting me games that are relevant to our interests um, all morning. Ooh. There's one called Bear and Breakfast, uh, where you, I believe, are a bear running a bed and breakfast. Um, there is one called Spirit Farer, which Ooh. is, quote, a cozy management game about dying. <gasps> And then Raji, an ancient epic where you are um, a, a girl in ancient India tasked with like defending uh, the world by the gods against evil. I got to look up and see if that last one is available on PS4 or Xbox. Oh, and then Hades, which is uh, your prince of the underworld escaping Hades. Oh, fuck yeah. Nice. So I'm really glad we had this experience. I am now going to, I think, lose myself in an ancient uh, world or in being the ferryman of a boat. For the Sounds time. fun good way to spend your afternoon well thanks guys and uh be careful uh, when you're when you're trying to sleep at a top bunk and remember to stay creepy stay cool thanks again to our sponsors at stitchfix.com slash spirits you'll get 25 percent off when you keep all of the items in your fix and at calm.com slash spirits you'll get 40 percent off a calm premium subscription Spirits was created by Amanda McLaughlin, Julia Shafidi, and Eric Schneider, with music by Kevin McLeod and visual design by Allison Wakeman. Keep up with all things creepy and cool by following us at Spirits Podcast on Twitter, Instagram, Facebook, and Tumblr. We also have all of our episode transcripts, guest appearances, and merch on our website, as well as a form to send us your urban legends at spiritspodcast.com. Join our member community on Patreon, patreon.com slash spiritspodcast for all kinds of behind the scenes stuff. Just one dollar gets you access to audio extras with so much more available too. Recipe cards, director's commentaries, exclusive merch, and real physical gifts. We are a founding member of Multitude, a collective of independent audio professionals. If you like spirits, you will love the other shows that live on our website at multitude.productions. And above all else, if you liked what you heard today, please share us with your friends. That is the very best way to help us keep on growing. Thank you so much for listening. Till next time.